Rufim Habaim, everyone, good evening. Thank you all for coming here tonight. And welcome to the fourth Alan J. Tickner Memorial Symposium this year on the topic, Conservative Judaism Directions for Today and Tomorrow. On behalf of Congregation Mishkan Tefillah, I am honored to welcome the leadership of three central branches of the conservative movement to our communal home. Tonight, our movement begins the celebration, marking 100 years since the United Synagogue was founded. Mishkan Tefillah is proud to be one of the charter congregations. The Tickner Symposia has become a regular and important community program, and I want to appreciate tonight the work of Alan's son-in-law, Sid Lafer, in developing the concept for tonight's important program. Sid is devoted to the local Jewish community and to the State of Israel, and Mishkan Tefillah is enriched by his active participation. We welcome the extended Tickner family here tonight, and I also want to especially honor the presence of Alan's partner, Margie Tickner, who is a stalwart of our congregation and personally dear to me and my family. Before we hear from our speakers, we are going to remember the man in whose memory this symposium was conceived, Alan Tickner. To say a few words about their grandfather, we welcome tonight to the podium Tammy Steinman and Hannah Leifer. Tammy is active in her home congregation, Temple Israel of Natick. She has also worked at Hebrew College and the JCRC, where she directed the Greater Boston Jewish Coalition for Literacy. Hannah is a recent graduate of the University of Rochester, having spent a semester at Tel Aviv University. She is currently working as a legal recruiting assistant and settling into new roles with CJP in young leadership. Alan's extraordinary accomplishments include the legacy that he left to this generation. Like so many in Alan's extended family, Tammy and Hannah are continuing his work of socially meaningful Jewish activism. I am delighted to welcome both of you here this evening. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We are honored to represent Alan's 12 grandchildren as we present a tribute to our grandfather, Alan Tickner. He would have been so proud that his legacy is being fulfilled in this way. Papa played a huge role in Boston's strong Jewish community. His greatest strength as a community organizer was in creating stronger alliances between Jewish organizations, particularly CJP and synagogues. He was a team player and always aimed to bring together the right combination of talent, knowledge, and passion for Judaism in order to enhance our community. To name a few of his achievements, he was the international president of United Synagogue, co-founder of the Synagogue Council of Massachusetts, served on the board of directors of many organizations, including the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Solomon Schechter Day School. He was the president of Camp Ramach and the president of Congregation Mishkin Tefillah. We remember our grandfather not only as a role model for all of us in his commitment and passion for building a strong Jewish community, but also as the warm and kind patriarch of our family. After graduating from college, I set out to become a Jewish professional, landing my first job at Hebrew College. Not surprisingly, my grandfather was extremely influential in this decision. I recall our long walks on Country Club Road, where he would share his three priorities for growing the Jewish community in Boston and around the world. They were, first, his belief that education is the key to passing on our Jewish heritage and values to future generations, Second, his ideals for both the local Jewish community as well as in Israel. And third, his vision for how I, my sisters, and cousins would grow up to become committed Jews and select partners with whom we would build our own Jewish families. He was so inspiring and passionate. Jewish education was very important to my grandfather. He would have been excited about my siblings and my decision to attend Gam Academy. The value of a solid education was strongly emphasized by our grandparents and I'm sure he would have been proud of our success there. We have all set our own paths for our Jewish education, 
through religious school, study abroad, camp, and college experiences. Papa's legacy continues beyond our own family as our Granny March continues their tradition of presenting a brand new sea door to each sixth grade student every year at Solomon Schechter. Papa passed down to all of us the idea that Judaism, specifically Tikkun Olam, is about making the world a better place both personally and communally. For many of us, our Jewish values guided us to pursue careers in improving public education through national service programs or professional experiences. Papa would be gratified by all that his children and our respective communities have done to improve the lives of inner city and underserved youth. Papa also passed down the significance of the state of Israel in our lives. Our relationship with Israel as a family began during the spring of 1995 when our grandparents brought us on the Michigan to Villa trip to Israel. Since then, we have each developed our own connection with Israel through camp and youth group trips, study abroad experiences, attending ATAC conventions, serving on various committees, and living in the country for work and study purposes. A top destination for our family when visiting Israel is the Alan J. Tickner Building at the Fuchsburg Center in Jerusalem. The building is not only a physical reminder of his contribution to conservative Judaism, but a symbol of how dedicated he was to the land that meant so much to him. Papa envisioned a place for Jewish youth to have a home in Israel. Though he would have undoubtedly been honored by having his name on the building, he cared much more about what would go on inside. He would have been thrilled by the modern day facilities, which is filled with youth every day. Not only does it serve, conserv does it serve conservative Jews, but it has also been used for a variety of communal pur purposes including hosting a meeting between Seeds of Peace and a group of American Jewish high school students and donating space for language lessons for African refugees. Finally, our grandfather understood and prioritized the role of children in preserving our Jewish values as a community. It was especially important to him that his children and grandchildren would build Jewish, Jewish families, but his passion for Jewish continuity really extended throughout the entire community. I know he would be proud of our selection and partners as he, as we have begun to create a foundation for our families based in Jewish values, as well as his great grandchildren as they begin to develop their own senses of Jewish identity. A few weeks ago, my five-year-old son, whose name is Alan, confidently chanted holiday songs at our Rosh Hashanah table that he learned at the Judy Gordon Nursery School at Temple Israel in Nada. Not only has our family come full circle, but our community continues to grow, giving children new excitement and love for our Jewish traditions. Collectively, the 12 of us have been able to carry our grandfather's passion and love for the Jewish community through many different paths. Puppetic's influence and legacy have been a foundation for who we are as a family, and our community has flourished beyond even what we would have imagined. Tonight, at the 4th Allen G. Tickner Memorial Fund Symposium, we will hear from an impressive panel of Jewish leaders about the future of conservative Judaism. Thank you to everyone who's participating in this meaningful discussion. We would also like to thank our Granny March, for without her, this program would not exist. I would also like to acknowledge my dad, Sid, for spending countless hours on tonight's event. Now, it is our pleasure to introduce Jonathan Sarna. Jonathan D. Sarna is the Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis University and chairs its Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program. He also chairs the Academic Advisory and Editorial Board of the Jacob Rader Markham Center of the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati and serves as Chief Historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. A more complete biography can be found in the program book. We welcome Professor Sarna as the moderator for this evening's program. Well, thank you, and thank you for that beautiful introduction, and good evening. Uh, it's really an honor uh, for me to serve as moderator for this year's Tickner Memorial Tickner Symposium. It's really a magnificent memorial to Alan. And uh, this evening, we also have a, a historic attention, uh, really a, a wonderful gathering of the senior leadership of the conservative movement. What we have here this evening is the conservative Jewish equivalent of a, of a major address by the president and response.
responses by the leaders of the two houses of Congress. <laughs> the vice presidents are off doing something else. Uh, we are seriously going to learn this evening from the leading figures in the movement about, the, about conservative Judaism's directions for today and tomorrow. Now, this can fill up one of the founding congregations of the conservative movement is a most appropriate venue for this gathering. Rabbi Herman Rabinovitz, you can see his picture outside, who held this pulpit for 36 years, beginning in 1910, was a disciple of Solomon Schechter, an incorporator, as you heard, of the United Synagogue, about to celebrate its centennial, and an architect of the conservative movement as a whole. Thanks in part to Rabbi Rabinovitz and to this historic congregation, the conservative movement became the fastest growing movement in American Judaism and one of the most successful movements in all of American religion for roughly half a century. To give you a sense of what this means, consider that the United Synagogue began in 1913 with but 16 founding conservative congregations. Yes, Mishkan Phila was one of them. By the time Rabbi Rabinovitz passed away in 1966, that number had bounded from 16 to about 800. So conservative Judaism uh, was the Google of its day. <laughs> Similarly, the Rabbinical Assembly, originally known as the Alumni Association of the Jewish Theological Seminary, boasted all of about 40 members when Rabbi Rabinovitz was ordained in 1908. Six decades later, the RA proudly admitted its 1,000th member. In the early 1970s, some one and one half million American Jews belonged to conservative congregations. Now, more recently, as everyone in this room knows, the conservative movement has declined in numbers. The 2001 National Jewish Population Study showed that the reform movement had overtaken the conservative movement and become the largest Jewish religious movement in America. The survey showed, and others have since confirmed, that the conservative movement was aging and shrinking and suffering from a dearth of children one wag suggested that every conservative synagogue should introduce mandatory sex education classes for its members. Rabbi Gordon is taking careful notes. Uh, recently, the 2011 New York Jewish Population Study showed that while 34% of New Yorkers had identified as conservative Jews in 1991, only 19% do today. In terms of children, only 11% of New York's Jewish children today identify as conservative. By contrast, 61% of those children are orthodox. Conservative Judaism is not the first movement in American Jewish life to face these kinds of challenges. Mass immigration of East European Jews in the late 19th and early 20th centuries posed an enormous challenge to American Reform Judaism. As late as 1940, that movement was literally struggling to survive. It was, by far, the smallest Jewish religious movement in the country with just 265 congregations and only 59,000 family memberships. With its back to the wall, Reform Judaism 
successfully transform itself. Today, reform is the largest of our Jewish religious movements. In the 1950s, the demise of Orthodox Judaism in America was widely predicted. A famous 1952 study found that only 23% of the children of Orthodox Jews intended to remain Orthodox. Orthodoxy during the 1950s dropped to third place behind conservative and reform Judaism in numerical strength. But like reform Judaism, orthodoxy refused to die out and instead transformed itself. In recent years, as we have seen, it has been growing quite rapidly. So the question facing the conservative movement this evening is whether, like reform and orthodoxy in earlier decades, it too can now transform itself and regain market share. Can it revision its mission to face the challenges of today and tomorrow? That is the big question facing our dream team panel that sits before you. And we're going to begin with Chancellor Arnold Eisen, really one of our foremost experts on American Judaism and modern Jewish thought. Uh, you have the Chancellor's biography in your booklets. Suffice it to say that he literally wrote the award-winning book entitled Rethinking Modern Judaism. There is nobody alive who is better equipped to help us <laughs> rethink conservative Judaism for today and tomorrow. Please join me. There will be no hyperbole in the vice presidential debate to match that of my good friend Jonathan Sarno. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be back at Mishkan Tefillah to once again participate in the Tikta Memorial Lecture. More of a pleasure because my former student and friend Lenny Gordon is now the rabbi at Mishkan Tefillah. And because unlike the last time I appeared, I'm joined by Steve Warnick and Julie Schoenfeld as co-leaders of this movement of ours, which I have to say, Jonathan, the answer to your question is a definitive yes. We can do this, we will do this, we are doing this, and I'm here to say why I am not among the pessimists when it comes to the future of conservative Judaism. I'm among the optimists, and I don't see this as a matter of faith. I see this as a matter of doing the work that needs to be done for Jewry in North America, right here, right now, which I think the conservative movement has a superb chance of accomplishing in this generation of ours. Before I explain why, I just want to say a word to Margie and the family. You know, when I was young, I used to think that everything in the world depended on books. And the people who changed the world were the people who wrote the books. And I wanted to be one of those people who wrote the books. And I became one of those people who wrote the books. But as I grew a little bit older and started understanding the way things work in the Jewish world and elsewhere, I learned that the Jewish people are not here today in far-flung communities around the world, 3,000 years after this project began, because a few people wrote some great books, even though the books matter. We are here because lay leaders like Alan Tickner worked with professional leaders in imaginative ways to do what needed to be done day in and day out, year in year out, to build institutions, to rebuild institutions, to form partnerships that were not otherwise there. And it's because of this 
let's call it wisdom or collective experience or perhaps genius that the Jewish people has had for 3,000 years in producing lay leaders who know how to work with rabbis, cantors, educators, other professional leaders, that we are all sitting here tonight worrying about the Jewish future. And the reason why we can be optimistic as we worry about the Jewish future is because we've come through so much as a people and as a community. We've survived so many curses. I think we can survive and thrive in blessing, which is the situation that American Jews have right now. Not curse, but blessing. I want to reflect with you in the next few minutes about what I've experienced lately, what I've learned since the last time I was here to give a Tickner lecture five years ago. My wife would tell you that there's less hair in my head now than there was five years ago and a lot more of it is gray. But I think there have been some really good learning experiences that have made me better able to appreciate our possibilities. And five years after taking the job of Chancellor of JTS, I am not less but more convinced that if we continue doing the things we are doing to transform conservative Judaism as part of a larger effort by American Jews to seize hold of the opportunities we have in our very hands right now, which are unique opportunities in the history of the Jewish people, we have every chance in the world to turn the situation around and make a movement that we can be proud to leave to our children and our grandchildren. So I have often said that there are three tasks that need doing, and you'll hear when my colleagues Rabbi Wernick and Rabbi Schoenfeld stand up that there is absolute agreement among all of us that these kinds of things need doing. One is we all agree that the path is the right path, that conservative Judaism is a great way to be a Jewish human being. Not only in this time and place, but it's the way that our Torah meant us to be. Let me say that contrary to some students of conservative Judaism, and some people who speak about conservative Judaism from the outside, I don't think about conservative Judaism as some compromise which we Jews made with modernity because we really weren't courageous enough to just be Jews, or we really wanted to have it both ways and be part of the modern world and also be part of the Jewish world, I regard conservative Judaism as what the Torah wants us to do. I regard conservative Judaism as the most authentic continuation of what the rabbis and sages of our tradition put in place 2,000 years ago. I regard this marriage between firm rooting in the Jewish past and full engagement with the larger society and culture of the present, I regard this as what Torah instructs us to do. So then you might say, well, if we've got the right path, what's wrong? And I would say, a quick analysis, one thing that we haven't done well enough is what we call messaging. We have not gotten the word out to conservative Jews, let alone to other Jews, what it is we stand for. And I, as Chancellor of JTS, can say that JTS takes some responsibility for this lacuna in the past, and a lot of my efforts right now are dedicated to making sure that we train conservative prof and prof professional and conservative uh, professors, well, conservative professional and lay leaders who know how to get this message out. And JTS itself, you may have seen, is making efforts to get the message out about conservative Judaism. For example, I myself just put on the web an essay which is published in print and put on the web with the help of a family no other than the Cases family. The Cases publication series is bringing out an essay of mine on conservative Judaism built on my blog series from last year, and it's one of many ways in which we at JTS and others are going to try to get the word out about what conservative Judaism is what it stands for, and why it is a compelling message in a compelling way for contemporary American Jews. The second thing, and the main thing, is that we haven't done an adequate job of what we might call quality control. That we are a movement that consists of many hundreds of what you might call franchised operations. Synagogues, and schools, and camps, and youth groups, 
scattered at least throughout North America, and in some cases throughout the world, and we have not managed to ensure that there is excellence in everything we do, and we have not managed to reproduce the excellence we do have in some places and replicate it in other places. But I am one of those who believes that there are so many cases of excellence abounding in conservative institutions right now. There are so many high quality camps and schools, both day schools and congregational schools, and synagogues and youth groups, and there is so much talent in the pool of lay and professional leadership we have available. But if we can do a better job at organizing and replicating our quality, we are going to be in very good shape for our future. And I'll be talking as well my colleagues on the BEMA tonight about how we can do a better job at improving quality, replicating quality, sharing the wealth of good ideas which are popping up all over the place. The third thing which I think has bedeviled us is structure or lack of structure. It frustrated me no end when I first became the Chancellor of JTS, when I realized that JTS or any other entity, organization, affiliated with conservative Judaism, has no one address to which to turn to get things accomplished in the conservative movement. There are about 15 different addresses. And sometimes we've cooperated well, and sometimes we haven't cooperated so well. Sometimes we manage to get together when it counted, and at other moments, sad to say, even when it counted, we weren't able to pull our talents and pull our resources and get the jobs done that needed to be done. And one of the things that pleases me the most about appearing on this BMO with Rabbi Schoenfeld and Rabbi Warrington is that I have a firm sense, which I did not have five years ago, that this movement is now pulling together and taking advantage of the resources it has to meet the opportunities which are definitely out there. And I want to say one more thing before launching into my remarks about how I think we should do this. Our greatest resource, to my mind, are the men and women who make up conservative congregations. I don't think the salvation of the Jewish people is in numbers. Never has been, is not now. Billions of people in the world, maybe 15 million Jews. It's amazing we're here. It's amazing we accomplish what we do. It's remarkable the achievements that this people make. And we don't do it because of numbers. We do it because of quality, because of the intensive effort invested in each and every Jew, convincing them that they can make a difference in this world. The same thing holds true of conservative Judaism. We're not going to be the most numerous movement in the next few years. We don't have the birth rate that orthodoxy has, and we don't have the huge influx of intermarried couples that the reform movement has right now, which is providing, according to the statisticians, most of the increase in population in reform Judaism. But what we do have is an incredible array of talent and knowledge and commitment and love for the Jewish people and Israel and Judaism and sitting in our congregations. And if we can find a way of mobilizing it more effectively, that is going to be the key to the thriving of conservative Judaism in the next few years, along with leadership that is trained in the art of building community and purveying meaning, which as you'll hear from me over the next few minutes, is my recipe for the Jewish future and the conservative Jewish future in particular, building communities and purveying a kind of meaning in them that gets at the mind and the heart and soul of contemporary Jews and makes them long for the kinds of experiences that they have in conservative Jewish auspices. So because I think that's the key, because I think experiences are the key, I'm not going to do a theoretical exercise tonight and try to take you through the history or philosophy of conservative Judaism. And those who want to hear something about my views on a set of topics like mitzvah, tefillah, covenant, learning, I invite you to go on the website and read the cases 
publication, Conservative Judaism for Today and Tomorrow, which we have just put up right now in connection with the Tikkun lecture. Instead, let me speak, as it were, from the inside and recall all of us to some of the experiences that I had, and I think you likely shared with me over the past few weeks. Because here we are coming out of the, the season, which is perhaps the most deeply meaningful to Jews, certainly in terms of introspection about who we are and where we are in life as a community, as individuals. Here we are at Shabbat Bereshit. There is no better time to think of changing ourselves and what we're going to do differently in the year ahead. And so I want to talk from the realm of experience. And I hope you'll join me in reflecting in the next few minutes over several experiences that we might have had in synagogue or out of synagogue with families or with friends in the last few weeks. So I'm going to start the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. I happen to be a lifelong lover of the book of Deuteronomy ever since I was a teenager. And I had the good fortune that my minion in New York, a conservative congregation on Chesed, invited me to lead a study session after services on the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. And I chose to speak about the portion of that week, Nitzavim, and how it seemed to me a perfect portion to usher us into my holiday period. And I want to take the next few minutes because I believe that the beginning and end of Jewish life is always Torah, and that's certainly true of conservative Jewish life. I want to spend the next few minutes about talking Torah, but doing it in a way that hits us where we are in 2012. So, Yopin Parashat Savim, you know that Moses is about to die. The Israelites are about to cross to the Promised Land without him. And Moses gives this remarkable address, which is like a kind of ethical will. If you've got to sum it up in a 15-minute talk, what do you say? And he opens by saying, some words that profoundly resonate with me. Atem Nitzavim Hayom, you are standing this day before the Lord your God as part of this covenant. And when he said, you are standing here, he makes it clear that he means everybody. Not just some small elite group of prophets, not just priests, but all of Israel. And he makes a point of saying all of Israel from the highest to the lowest and even the stranger who lives within your gates. So in other words, Moses' first words in this address are words of inclusive community. You're all standing here. Whether you're older or younger, married or single, gay or straight, man or woman, you have something to give and this covenant needs you. And then he goes on and says something else which hits me even more strongly than that. He said, I'm not just making this covenant with those of you who are standing here this day, but with those who are not standing here with us this day. And when I hear those words, as I expect you do, what am I doing at Rosh Hashanah when I'm looking around the room at the empty chairs? There are empty chairs in Armenia, you know, people who were there to celebrate Rosh Hashanah with us the previous year and were not here this year. And I'm thinking of my parents. And I'm thinking of my friends who are no longer here. And I know that when I carry on this covenant of our people, no matter how I carry it on, I am doing it with them beside me. And in a sense, I'm doing it for them. Because those generations don't any longer get a chance to live Torah as we do. They don't get a chance to build a Jewish future. But we do, and when we do it, we do it with them and for them. And by the same token, the other group that's not here with us today, but whom Moses addresses nonetheless, are the generations that come after us. And I don't know about you, but I very keenly feel, as a Jew, as a conservative Jew, that I am in this not just for myself and not just for my generation, but I am carrying on a path which has evolved and changed over the past 3,000 years, and I intend to pass it on as a living tradition for my children and grandchildren and my students and my students' students. And then the anxiety about the Jewish future will be theirs. But right now it's ours. And the confidence we have in this 
is because we've been doing this for a very long time, and we're part of this chain. And the key word of our kind of Judaism, I think, is this word tradition. That we've been passing on this ever-changing, ever-growing, continually steadfast legacy from generation to generation. And you know, I look back, and you don't have to be a historian to do this. I don't do this for my books. I do this for my personal experience. I think of both my grandparents, who were immigrant tailors in Philadelphia and had no general education to speak of, and no Jewish education to speak of. Can my Judaism be theirs? And I think of my father and my mother, neither of whom got to go to college, neither of whom ever touched a computer, let alone a smartphone. Can my Judaism and my children's Judaism be theirs? And the answer is clear. No, it can't be, but yes, it must be, and yes, it is. And the previous generations, if they were somehow transplanted to our synagogue tonight and looked at us, might not recognize their Judaism in us, but we know looking back that it is. It's continuous, it is their Judaism. Moses really did make this covenant, not just with those who were here a long time ago, but for those who were coming. And when we stand here and listen to that Torah and make it ours in what we learn and what we do, he really is speaking to us, and we're included in that Atem Nitzavim. You and I are really standing there as part of this tradition. Carry on with me for two more minutes in this vein. Then what does he do? You have this amazing paragraph where Moses reminds us that we can't know in this world, in this life, some of the things we most desperately want to know. The hidden things, the Nistarot, belong to the Lord our God, the Niglot, the revealed things, are given to us and to our children to do all the words of this Torah. This to me is precious. This is Judaism. It's also a precious ingredient of conservative Judaism, because conservative Judaism begins with the assumption that no theology is ever going to be adequate. There's no one way to capture the truth of God. There's no one way to understand what God wants. There's no one way to be a good Jew. We're here as members of this covenant people, this Jewish people, to do the best we can in untried circumstances, like having a revolutionary event like the creation of the State of Israel, or a revolutionary event like the opportunities we have in the United States of America today, we're here to take that age-old covenant and make it live. And there's no formula for doing that because God's not here in front of us. You can't hold God in your hand, but you do the best you can with what you got. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you may find that you get what you need to do, not to think it through, but to do to live a Jewish life. That, to me, has always been the saving grace of conservative Judaism, that it understood that we don't have this purchase on truth that some people think they have. We've got this tradition, and we've got learning, and we've got communities, we've got one another, and we've got our wisdom from the larger world, our arts, and our sciences, and our physicians, and our attorneys, and our business people, and if all of us put our experience together, you and I can make a go of this, and we can do Torah. We won't know what happens after death, we won't know how history is going to turn out, but we have enough to make a go of it. I want to turn now to a second experience that I had. I happened to daven in the high holiday services that JTS has, which are free and open to the public. And what we do at JTS, like magic, every Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is take people who come in off the street from many different backgrounds, Jews of all sorts, some non-Jews who are there to be with the Jews they love, and we meld these people into a community with a certain kind of music, a certain kind of speaking, dialogue, humor, seriousness, welcome, two rabbis on the bimo alternating as Sholiach Tzipor and as speakers, one man, one woman. There are certain ingredients to this service which are quintessentially aspects of conservative Judaism. A wonderful creation that this generation gets to have, and I don't know about you, but I leave that 25-hour fast of Yom Kippur every year, not only hungry and with a headache, but 
grateful to God that I am a Jew who's able to be part of a community that lives Judaism the way that we do. And I want to say that one of the things that makes that experience where it is today, at JTLs and elsewhere, is we use this wonderful love store, Leif Shalem, published by the Conservative Movement, the Rabbinical Assembly, which has that Hebrew original, the service is immersed in Hebrew, the service is immersed in music, and yet there's also contemporary music, and thankfully on the margins of that love store, you not only have the rabbis of old, and the rabbis of the Middle Ages, and the Hasidim, but you have Merle Feld, and Gilda Radner, and Jules and Nava Harlow, who are members of my minion. All sorts of contemporaries, and you know that this Jewish tradition of ours is a tradition of many voices composed over many, many generations. So, where you are, if you're me, and you've had this set of experiences, is you understand that what we need to do as Jews, and certainly as conservative Jews, more than anything else, First of all, is give people experiences of community. Community is the number one watchword, and that's why I am not just happy, but I am thrilled that the emphasis in the New United Synagogue is on building key laws. Because we are more than religious. Conservative Judaism is more than synagogues. They're very important. And synagogues are more than tefillah, as important as that is. We are communities of people bound together in a sacred task which needs to engage all of us and all of every single one of us. And if we can focus successfully on transforming synagogues and other institutions in our movement into true communities where every single person is valued for what he or she alone can contribute to the mix, we will succeed as we know, that the institutions in America that work best are those that foster communities, like camps, and day schools, and youth groups, and Israel trips, and synagogue schools that are really part of a synagogue, and synagogues themselves that can function as communities. If we can do this, and I think we now know a lot of the recipe, we're going to be able to persuade more and more existing members to be active in their shuls and schools and youth groups and camps and communities. And that's going to turn us around. I'll be talking about some details in about two minutes. I will come to a conclusion with some practical suggestions. But before I get that, I want to mention the other thing we do, which is provide meaning. This is a lonely world. And it's a world that kind of robs you of the serious life wherever you turn. It's kind of trivia all around. There's demeaning public talk. And you want a part of life that's uplifting, that gives you guidance, that tells you how it is you can be a good spouse to your spouse, or a good parent to your kids, or a good work co-worker for your fellow co-workers. And where do you get that from? Well, you get that from the content of what we learn and what we do as Jews. What we learn as Jews and what we do as Jews. And if I had more time this evening, I would make the case that what distinguishes conservative Judaism more than any other element in this movement is how we learn. And you don't appreciate it if you've only learned in conservative auspices. There are certain kinds of conversations you take for granted. But when you have a conversation about Bereshit this week, for example, that's going to go into contemporary biology, or the latest theories of string theory and the Big Bang, and expect that that is part of the conversation an intelligent Jew has about Bereshit, you're in the kind of conversation that conservative Judaism has thrived on for a very long time. We want to know what our medieval commentators have to say. We want to know what the rabbis have to say. But we also want to know what the scientists have to say and what the ethical implications of this incredible work we call Torah are. So it's a kind of learning that has gone on in conservative Judaism for a long time, which is really quite distinctive. I myself, if I would say that learning in community 
is one of the finest things that we do, and it's a great contribution not only to our movement, but to the Jewish world as a whole. The second thing is how we do mitzvah, how we do Torah, how we do Torah in a way that involves Israel as well as America, how we do Torah as in Magen Tzedek and Hesher Tzedek in a way that brings ritual and ethics together, how we do Torah in a way that brings the professional and personal experience of every one of you to bear on Jewish decision making. I want to know what that congregate of mine who works for the EPA has to say about stewarding God's plan. I want to know what physicians who make painful decisions about death and dying with their patients all the time, I want to know what those people have to say about the relationship between God and human beings that sacred liberation is all about. So, to my mind, put the emphasis on community and put the emphasis on the doing, the learning and the mitzvah and the two of them together. And that's a recipe for the future of conservative Judaism that is second to none. And now I want to conclude with four challenges to myself and my fellow leaders of the conservative movement. I think there are a few things, especially following on what I've just said, that we should focus on in the next few years. And I think that we should probably attach numbers to these challenges, which I'll try to do in a very tentative way tonight. Number one, we have to build communities. JTS is already training rabbis differently because we know that rabbis need to be community organizers and community builders. We have to understand what goes into a community. I would like to make sure that more and more members of our synagogues, let's say 10% within a couple of years, are members of Havarot, which get together outside the synagogue, in people's homes, over meals, to celebrate Shabbat and holidays and life cycle events because I believe that face-to-face -face community is the key to the Jewish future. A synagogue like Jewish feel is a wonderful kila. It should have sub-communities within it. I would like to find ways of organizing ourselves in the short term into Shabbat communities. And I pick Shabbat communities in particular because if there's one absence in the conservative movement, or one thing that we have too little of, that many people point to me, when they say why they prefer modern orthodoxy to conservative Judaism, for example, it is the lack of Shabbat communities. Shabbat is an incredible opportunity for us. Let's do a better job of making communities. Number two, we know that what makes the difference for kids and adolescents more than anything else, are immersive Jewish experiences of community and meaning together. Immersive Jewish experiences of meaning and community together. I'm just going to tick off three. These are not the only three, but these are a big three. Number one, Ramah. Ramah. We have not more than 7% of the children or families affiliated with conservative Judaism going to Camp Ramah. Mitch Cohen, the national director of Camp Ramah, assures me that we could increase that number to 10% in three years without straining current capacity. And if we go beyond that in our movement, we will find ways to add the capacity to meet those larger numbers. Every synagogue can do more proportionally to add to this population, but we know all the evidence is there, what the effect of this camp experience is. Why are we denying it to our kids? Money cannot get in the way, and there's ample money, I don't say there's enough, but there's a lot of money right now to go into Jewish camping. This is the time. Number two, day schools. JTS is about to partner in more significant ways with the Schechter schools and with other day schools. We know that nothing compares to that full-time experience of a Jewish reality when it comes to kids. The challenge, of course, is financing day schools. We will work with other members of the community in finding the financing. In the meantime, we're going to work in making sure that this education is the very finest that can be provided. And number three, a particular interest of mine, because I did not go to day school. 
I'm the graduate of congregational schools and a citywide after high school program for youth. I have made it one of my top priorities in the next five years of my chancellorship to work with my colleagues on the MEMA here in transforming congregational schools using methods of experiential learning that receive their finest achievement at Camp Vermont. We're going to try to bring the lessons of experiential learning to bear and use those lessons to transform congregational schools. And there is absolutely no project more important to me in my next four years as Chancellor of JTS. And this project to go where the kids are, because two-thirds of the conservative kids who are getting a Jewish education are getting it in supplementary schools. I want to go where those kids are, make a huge impact on those schools, which we can do if we pair them with immersive camp experiences. Number three, intensive learning experiences for adults. When JTS started its Science Initiative program several years ago, we found that in many congregations there was no experience on this model, which brings adults together in a two-way process, which starts with the adults sharing with one another what turns them on on the subject of Mitzvah, what excites them, what repels them, what commands them, what does not feel command them, why do they feel commanded. And we discovered that if you start off with a process like this, you not only open people to an experience where groups and individuals have resolved at the end of it to take on more meets fault than they were doing before, but you find people teaching one another and learning from the doing. They study the sources involved with take care of the needy. They then take care of the needy. They reflect on what it means to take care of the needy, and they all bring their individual expertises to bear on this project. A doctor can contribute things that a lawyer cannot, and vice versa. A business person has something to add to this discussion. This is a very kind of precious learning, which has been going on in conservative Judaism, and I think we have to make it a goal of our congregation that at least 10% of our congregation within two years are involved in active learning, and let's shoot for at least 25% by the end of the decade. It will transform our kilot if we're involved in active learning. Finally, I've saved the most difficult and controversial for last, and that's why I'm happy to sit down right after I say a word about this and turn it over to my colleagues. We must do something about synagogue services. Synagogues are the signature effort of the conservative movement. Tefillah is the signature effort of the synagogue. In particular, the Saturday morning service is what we're most judged by. And we currently succeed in attracting something like 5% of our members on a regular basis to Shabbat services. People are voting with their feet. Our services are not passionate enough. They're not intimate enough. They're not touching the heart enough. The music is not good enough. The spaces are often too large. And the services are too long. The services are too long. I think we need to mandate every single member congregation in the United Synagogue to not settle anymore. The halakhic issues can be overcome where there's a will, there is a way. We've been settling in too many places for too long. JTS is committed to a new sort of rabbinical and cantorial education devoted to revitalizing the North American Synagogue. I'm prepared to propose, as a lifelong conservative Jew, who's put in a lot of time in conservative services, that we, as a heuristic device, accept the goal of two-hour services on Saturday morning, with a little extra time added for B'nai Mitzvah or other special occasions. Let's take it as a goal, see what we would have to do to meet that goal, but it's not just a matter of shorter time. It's a matter of making every moment count. Of not just doing same old, same old. Because Judaism is never same old, same old. Here we are, Shabbat Breshid. Our tradition doesn't settle for same old, same old. It insists on shuvah. It insists on renewal. And I don't feel like a, a person Pollyannish at all I feel like a realist when I say to you 
that I believe that we hold the future of our people and our movement in our hands. If we want to turn this effort around, we can do this. Of course, money is always scarce. We can always use more money. All of us could. And we'll try to get some of that money. We, we don't have enough resources. But look at what we do have. Look at who's here in this room. Look at the lay leaders and professional leaders in this movement of ours. Look at the incredible array of institutions we have going for us. If we work together on this task, we are going to make conservative Judaism a movement that our grandchildren will look back to on with pride, knowing that we seeded the Jewish renaissance of the next generation. Thank you very much. take a moment to show off the publication. I got an advanced copy uh, uh, that the Chancellor was discussing. First of all, thank you to the Cases family for making it possible, but I uh, want to second the recommendation uh, that people obtain it. Now, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld, who is our next speaker, is the Executive Vice President of the Rabbinical Assembly, which is the international rabbinic arm of the Conservative Authority Movement. You have her biography in your program. She is a graduate of Bronx Science and Yale, where she wisely majored in history. She is a mother of two young children. And in connection with her being named by Jewish Women International as a woman to watch in 2011, she declared, and I quote, the conservative movement is not its institutions. It's a vast web of people inspired by powerful ideas who want to have an impact on the world. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Jesus. Thank you. I want to extend my thanks to the Tickner family for your leadership and for your hospitality. We should all be blessed someday to have our grandchildren give us that kind of a tribute. Uh, I, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues. I have the privilege of serving 1,600 of the finest Jewish leaders around the world. They are people of great learning, great wisdom and intelligence, and also great compassion and decency. And there is never a day in which I am not inspired and humbled by their contributions and their excellence in all that they do. So many of the rabbis in this region came tonight for this program, and if I may ask you to stand and be acknowledged, give a special note of thanks to my colleague, Rabbi Lenny Gordon. I know that you will appreciate what I mean when I say that for me, Rabbi Gordon exemplifies the very best of the conservative movement and the conservative rabbinate. I have known him since I was just ordained and we were both in congregations that had a Reconstructionist history and a conservative affiliation as well. And uh, Rabbi Gordon's wisdom and kindness to me continues to serve me to this day. And I also want to acknowledge, if you'll permit me, Rabbi Gordon was one of the uh, committee members and one of the prime contributors to Machzor Lev Shalem and certainly bears a significant percentage of the gratitude for its great success. Uh, with all of the endorsers I spoke to about the Mahsur and reporters and commentators, I would point them all to but three of the hundreds of comments in the book. And one of them, the first one actually, was always Rabbi Gordon's reading on religious doubt that accompanies Baha'u'llah Minim. 
and it is truly, I believe, one of the great works of theology of the last several years. And so, really, Rabbi Gordon, with great appreciation to you. On Sukkot, I was speaking to a friend of mine about her experiences on Yom Kippur. She is a grandmother, her children are out of the house, and she is taking many medicines. And the walk to shul would have been uphill, and the sitting and standing, very difficult. She had a sense that those difficulties would have been a distraction to the people around her, and that distraction unwelcome. And so she decided to stay at home and pray. She undertook the fast, saved the measure of water she needed to take her medications, and quietly to herself, in a silent house, she davened the matzor. By late afternoon, she was, of course, very tired. And so she told me, looking a bit sheepish, I got into bed with the matzor and finished the davening there. I know you are not supposed to do that. And then she said, I got so much out of it, I always get a lot out of the tefillot. I find there is so much wisdom there. And I felt so good that I was making a contribution by passing this on to the next generation. What did she mean? by doing her part to pass this on? Was it the Hebrew college education that came alongside her university <coughs> education? Was it the years of staying up late at night to cook family meals? Was it cobbling together funds to send children to school in order to pursue what she describes as the moral strain that runs through her family. No, that was not what she meant in that moment. What she meant in that moment was praying those prayers in that bed and feeling, really, that that moment was a contribution she was making to the next generation. You know the secrets of the universe, the mysteries of the universe, and the deepest secrets of everyone alive. In the Rabbinical Assembly, Machsor Lev Shalem, there's a passage opposite those words on Yom Kippur morning by the late Rabbi Max Rutenberg. He says, if I had to reduce the essential meaning of the vast religious panorama of the High Holy Days, I would select the word responsibility. First and always, you are responsible for yourself. What you do with your life, your body and soul, your intelligence, your creative talents. Judaism further teaches that a person does not live alone in the world. You are therefore responsible for the welfare of your neighbor, whether that person is next door or a continent away. You are responsible for the well-being of your fellow Jew, and it is charged to your account the treatment of all human beings. The end of the quote. The promulgation of conservative Judaism, a learned, committed Jewish expression vitally committed to the larger society is one of the greatest gifts that any of us can give future generations. And every time we pray, and every time we light candles, and every time we study, each of those acts is a <coughs> gift as enormous as all that has come before. But we only have it to give to the extent that we embrace it ourselves or aspire 
to embrace it ourselves, so that we too, in a silent house, with only God to hear our prayers, will feel that that <coughs> is a contribution to the next generation. And so I start here in thinking about a vision for the conservative movement. To me, the vision of a movement is first and foremost, as Dr. Sarna pointed out, not a vision for a seminary or a Tukhila organization or a rabbinic organization. It is an amplification of what I see and find in Judaism and the Jewish people. It is a prayer for us, really, more than a vision. What do we mean when we talk about the conservative movement or any movement? Because when you say conservative movement, people think about us and those institutions. But that's not what movements are. A movement, whether it be Zionism or civil rights or Hasidism or conservative Judaism, is about the ideas that unite the community and that motivate people to come together with a commitment to build some vision for the future. A movement inspires us to believe that the work of our lives can actually create change in the world. A movement is fueled by the convictions of people who find their own prayers meaningful, even in a silent house. The questions facing the conservative movement today are not any different from the questions that have faced the so-called major movements for the past 150 years. The question is how we, as a community, and each individual Jew can achieve a synthesis, a synthesis between open society's evolving norms and Judaism's unswerving moral and ritual mandates. We called it tradition and change. The Orthodox called it Torah Umara. The reform, especially in recent years, referred to tikkun olam, bringing a Jewish vision of social justice out into the public square. And in all cases, the most enthusiastic proponents of these systems seem to agree that much remains for all of us unsynthesized. But while we acknowledge that all these movements, all of them, are struggling with their definition, because the conservative movement was, as Dr. Sarna illustrated, the preeminent expression of 20th century Judaism in North America, and how our community became accustomed to telling its story and living its story, it should come as no surprise that as we struggle with making sense of the end of that past era and developing the norms of the new era, that the community is telling its story and expressing its anxiety through the lens of the conservative movement. And that is part of why the onslaught of criticism has been so relentless and in many cases disproportionate and distorted. In other words, we are very often the subject of stories that are not necessarily about us and surely are not only about us. This is further complicated because socially defined boundaries between groups have, as we know, greatly weakened, thus making identity more individually defined rather than a socially defined construct, a thesis of which Chancellor Eisen is one of the world's experts. But as a consequence, the striving for that synthesis between broad social engagement and Jewish engagement is further skewed, and the Jewish side of many of us much harder to find. The community's anxiety 
about its Jewish future has reached a fever pitch that managed to sustain itself for a remarkably long time. And it is my observation that part of the reason this narrative of anxiety is so long sustained is because the Jewish community in North America has quarantined much of that anxiety in the conservative movement. What do I mean by that? Since we represented the philosophy that most directly embraces the need for synthesis, and Chancellor Eisen, I think your talk was a beautiful articulation of that, it is easier to say that the conservative movement failed than to confront our fears that the community doesn't have the wherewithal or the will or the resources to achieve what we still maintain is necessary. A synthesis for each of us between Judaism and open society. But that synthesis of conservative Judaism is more urgent now than ever before for all of these reasons that the Chancellor enumerated. And it's urgent not only for the good of the Jewish people, but also for the good of these vast open societies that desperately need an infusion of the moral inspiration and personal discipline that our tradition offers. Much of what people are searching for, we have here. The conservative movement opens its doors wherever people are embarking on the path, wherever they are on the path, but we challenge everybody to keep going further. Hebrew language, Torah study, commitment to Israel are challenges we lay squarely before the community. And we embrace the realization that if we are commanded, and we do embrace that realization, it is a fundamental part of our theology, we're obligated to meet vote, then that commitment applies to the ritual precepts as well as the ethical ones. There is, in conservative Judaism, as in any religious path, a shuttle space between the ideals that we hold and share as a movement, and where many of us are at any given moment in achieving this synthesis. The continuing desire to hold those ideals and work towards them, or even to retain an imagination of what it would be like to work towards them, is the aspirational <laughs> essence of conservative Judaism. If every religious expression were to measure its right to exist by the perfect adherence of its adherence, religion would cease to exist. But that notwithstanding, this shuttle space between the ideals that we continue to admire and where we are at a given time causes some to suggest that in fact there is no distinctive conservative movement, but incorrectly to assert that there is a broad liberal or a uh, expression I love to dislike, a broad non-orthodox community. And that is not, that is not correct. Parenthetically, I also want to distinguish uh, between these suggestions of erasure of the distinctiveness of conservative Judaism and my understanding of what the, the Chancellor has referred to as the vital center. The vital center is something else. It is a recognition that some of the ideals that originated in and have been associated with conservative Judaism also now animate some communities that elect to name these ideals and values differently or elect not to name them at all. But there is a difference between holding certain values as treasured ideals, even if I do not yet meet them, and not holding those values. And this is a very important aspect in understanding how we move forward. 
How does one inhabit the space between what I have achieved of a religious ideal and the ideal? How does one face oneself in that space? How does one embrace others within that space? How does one work through ambivalences that persist even as we continue to maintain a sense of ira, a sense of awe for those values? And so in an era in which society does not define our Judaism, will we name it by our eternal aspirations or by our temporal limitations? We live in what has been called a post-ethnic age. And in a post-ethnic age, we must embrace Judaism as a religion, not only as an evolving religious civilization or a people, but we must embrace Judaism as a religion explicitly. Surely, first and foremost, there should be no judgment. There are no elites, we have no priestly class. We are all looking for places where we can grow. The Rabbinical Assembly examined these questions of how we can present Judaism in another uh, publication that we put out this year called The Observant Life, The Wisdom of Conservative Judaism for Contemporary Jews. And uh, the book is intended to um, be a new version of what was the space that was originally occupied by Isaac Klein's work. Uh, but it's a much different work than Isaac Klein's. It has 40 essays by 30 leading conservative rabbis, and the matters that were examined by Klein, which he limited to things such as synagogue practice, Shabbat, Kashrut, holidays, are still there, but they are there in the form of thoughtful essays that look not only at the how-tos, but look at understanding these practices in the form of larger human goals. And that segment of the book is but one third of the total content. The rest of the book are essays about how Judaism can inform our lives at home and how Judaism can inform our lives at work. So there are extensive chapters on medical ethics, business ethics, modesty, um, every aspect of life through a Jewish lens is taken up by the observant life. Uh, sexual ethics, journalistic ethics, civic conduct, taxes. And it looks at how our values can be applied to dilemmas that we actually encounter. This encounter, this program tonight, the question before us cannot be about how some other group of people who are not here will inspire yet another group of people who are also not here in the hopes that they will embrace some Jewish reality that we ourselves don't grasp. The question rests in the here and now with each of us. Over the course of the last 12 years, I have been party to conservatively about 750 rabbinic placements and possibly an upwards of even close to 1,000 rabbinic transitions where a rabbi leaves the congregation and they are looking for someone else to come and lead and serve. And in each of those cases, the congregation says the same thing. We are looking for a dynamic rabbi who will bring change, that will attract people to the congregation who are not presently here, every time. And in every rabbinic transition, everyone that succeeds certain realities are shared by all of the parties involved. 
And those realities are two. First, you must always begin with the people who are here. Because the people who are here either like things the way they are or liked them the way they were, and more importantly still, they are the people who are invested in and contributing to the life of the community. So we can't go out and serve some other community somewhere else that's not here. We have to do it together. And secondly, to understand that the great man or great woman or great rabbi theory of history is an idea whose time has passed. This is not about having one grand program that we will all follow. We must not speak in 20th century terms and look for that great man of history or the one great idea that will be the solution to all of our dilemmas. That is not what a 21st century religious movement is going to look like. The contemporary culture will not allow people to accept it and the delivery systems of cultural transmission no longer support it. Vision statements abound in the world. Others have given them before us. We are giving ours tonight. And then others will come, and they will give theirs. As Moshe said when Joshua came to complain about Eldad and Medad prophesying in the camp, Umi tain kol am Adonai neviim, would that all God's people were prophets. We will succeed to the extent that each one of us in the here and now can take possession of our own Judaism and make our contribution with the people who surround us. Briefly, I heard two wonderful speeches on Tuesday, and I bet many of you did too. They were the Fatan Torah and the Kalat Breshit in the conservative synagogue where I daven. The Fatan Torah is a man of great substance. He is deputy general counsel to a large company, and yet he has found the time for several years to be the person who runs and oversees our congregation's daily minion. He got up, he gave a speech, it was not even five minutes long, he said not a word about himself. This is what he did. He named people who used to daven in that daily minion and are no longer with us, and he turned to the few hundred people who were gathered in the sanctuary that day and said, we need you. We need your help making a minion. And what I loved about it was, it was a gap he could close, right? These were committed people who showed up on a Tuesday after so many holidays. And I know that of the people he told in the sanctuary, several of them will start to come to that minion. And it will have an impact on their lives. And there will be people who will show up to say Kaddish for all kinds of reasons. And those people's presence there will change their lives. And for some of both of those groups of people, their family members, their children will see parents more engaged in Judaism. And more of them will go forth into the next generation with a positive, meaningful connection. The Kalat Rishit was an equally inspiring person. She is a single woman. She lives alone. She had two hips replaced this summer. And she talked about how someone from the congregation invited her to live in their first floor apartment. And other people drove her to rehab. And other people cooked her meals and brought her things. And she said that her vision was that the Fesed committee that she chairs will make it possible for anybody in the congregation who needs that kind of help to get it. And every person sitting in this room tonight has such a contribution that only you can make. It is personal, it is proximate, 
and it is yours alone to do. I mention this book, The Observant Life, that has 40 chapters in it. If you got together with a few other households and said once a month, we'll invite one household that seems sort of marginally connected to Judaism, and we'll talk about one chapter in The Observant Life. In four years, 200 people not so connected to Judaism will have had community, they will have had Shabbat, and they will have had Torah study. And somehow, some number of those 200 people, maybe it's three, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, will carry Judaism into the next generation who otherwise might not have and that opportunity is right here and right now and yours to do. The conservative movement is not a conductor on a 20th century train that tells us where to get on and when to get off. We can work together to move from ruminating about conservative Judaism in a way that describes our anxiety about the Jewish future, to living conservative Judaism in a way that resolves our anxiety and creates the Jewish future. In order to move forward, we need to make peace with our Judaism, peace with ourselves, and peace with our movement. And someday, when we are too tired at the end of the fast to stand before the open ark for Ne'ilah, we too should know the merit to take the machsor into our bed with us and pray its prayers and know that that action is a great contribution to the next generation. Stephen Wernick. Uh, he serves as the CEO of what he emphasizes and underlines is the new United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism. Uh, see the biography in your program. Uh, rabbi Wernick is a second generation rabbi. He's enjoyed fabulous success first in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, more recently at out of Israel in suburban Philadelphia. And uh, recently, he has helped to engineer a new three-point agenda for the synagogues of conservative Judaism. It calls for strengthening Kihilot, creating an integrated conservative educational system for preschool to high school, and developing new congregations and leadership. Join me in welcoming Rabbi Stephen. There we go. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> As uh, Professor Sarna was introducing me, the Chancellor leaned over and said, hello, Miles. Um, the truth is, uh, it's really not all that far to go because um, the, the title of this evening, of course, is Directions for Today and Tomorrow. So I thought I would type into my GPS system, Conservative Judaism. Um, and what came up was only 1.5 miles away, the international office, or the district offices, rather, of the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism. So, good night. <laughs> Um, I, I was also uh, struck by um, the Chancellor's, or should I, should I say, um, His Honor the President, um, and the uh, comment 
um, of how Rabbi Schoenfeld and I represent the House and the Senate. The fact that she's wearing blue and I'm wearing a red tie is completely coincidental. Um, it, it, in some ways, um, I, I think we're missing an important point in this conversation. Um, and in listening to the comments uh, of my colleagues, um, so much of, of what they said is, yeah, absolutely, sign me up, let's go. Um, in terms of response to the Chancellor, the only thing I would say is I think we've got to raise the bar. Um, and that the numbers that we put out there, the work that we want to do for engagement in all those areas, um, we should raise the bar. Um, we should double the number of kids that go to Camp Vermont in the next decade. We should double the number of kids that are involved in USY in the next decade. We should um, grow exponentially by a factor of 10 the number of adults that are involved in serious Jewish learning. Um, we, we have to stop holding ourselves back and we have to really believe what we say, that conservative Judaism matters. And it matters not only to us, it matters to the entire Jewish world. We live in a society that is becoming more and more polarized, by which the fringes on both the left and the right of whatever spectrum you want to measure are pulling at the middle and we've lost the ability for civility for what's reasonable and what's rational, and we have, in some ways, I think, passed off the responsibility of what is religion to others. And it's an image of religion that is uncompromising, it's an image of religion that is not authentic to the tradition, and it is one that we have to reclaim unapologetically, um, loudly, and put that banner up there, not just for those that are involved in our communities, but for the entire Jewish world. That conservative Judaism represents a Judaism that comes from within the tradition itself. And we have to be able to articulate that our unique value added to the world, perhaps as the Chancellor said, the most distinguishing element of conservative Judaism is the way in which we learn, and that that has been true for centuries. And we all have to be able to point when we say that to an example from the tradition that proves it from within and not something coming from without. The example that I've been using lately is, is two texts. The first is from the Mishnah, Masechet Shabbat. In the second chapter, there's a discussion about when is it permissible to extinguish a flame on Shabbat. The penalty according to the Torah for both lighting a fire and for extinguishing a fire is death. It's pretty severe. I want to make sure you're still with me. <laughs> it's pretty severe. But the Mishnah, in the year 200 or 250, when it was codified, the Mishnah understood that there may be circumstances in which one may be permitted to extinguish a flame, and if not permitted, certainly not to be punished if they did so. It's the ancient tradition of better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. It comes from the Mishnah and Shabbat. There's four reasons given. The first is because you're afraid of, of notesreen, of, of foreigners, right? Probably referring specifically to the Roman soldiers. The second reason given is you're afraid of leasing, of highwaymen, that if you're traveling along the way and you make a fire and you have to keep yourself warm because it's Shabbat and so forth, if leasing come, they'll see the fire, they'll rob you, they might even kill you. So therefore, it's you're, you're allowed to extinguish the, the flame um, and not be punished. The third is interesting. The Mishnah calls it Ruach Ra'ah. What does that mean? What's Ruach? A, a, a wind or a spirit and Ra'ah, Ra? Evil. Right? So the third reason the Mishnah gives that you can extinguish a flame on Shabbat and not be punished by death is because you're afraid of ghosts. And then the fourth is that you can do it because of providing for someone who perhaps is ill and, and, and uh, an ill person on their bed and they can't sleep, so you can extinguish the flame in order to allow that person to sleep. That's the mission. 
At the time of the Mishnah, the phrase Ruach Ra'a probably meant, literally, ghosts. That's how they understood it. Right? That people were afraid of shaitim, of demons. Um, it was something real, it was not something imaginary. Several hundred years later, 700 years before Freud, along, along comes Maimonides. What did Maimonides do for a living? He was a doctor. His first comment on this Mishnah is he wants to understand what is Ruach Ra'ah? And why on earth would we be allowed to extinguish a flame on Shabbat because we're afraid of Ruach Ra'ah? And the first word in his commentary is a melancholiot. Melancholy. 700 years before Freud, Rambam is diagnosing depression. And he's saying that if a person is depressed, if their senses have gone from them, it is permissible to extinguish, well, it, you can be forgiven rather, I should, my language should be exact. You can be forgiven for extinguishing a flame on Shabbat. That's not something that comes from outside the tradition, that's something that comes from within. That's taking this tradition that goes back to Torah, to Sinai, to an understanding of being in relationship with God and understanding the unfolding process of revelation in every generation and overlaying it with modern science and understanding and meaning and purpose so it makes sense. So that when we come to study Torah in its broadest capacity, we don't need to check our brains at the door to walk in for something that's religion as if it's disconnected from the rest of the reality in which we live. That's Judaism. And that's the space in the Jewish world when it comes to learning that conservative Judaism owns. But we've kind of given it away and we need to reclaim it. Um, and so the Chancellor's challenges for increasing learning at every level in every modality of learning is one that we have to take up and we have to own and we have to stop setting small standards about it. We have to say this is important, it matters, it's meaningful, and it's open for anybody who wants to be a part of it. And let's raise our banner high um, and stop trying to um, explain away who we are and what we believe in. Conversation isn't about conservative movements, it isn't about conservative Judaism, it's about Judaism. And our approach to it is real, it's meaningful, and it matters. And the world needs it today more than it has ever needed it before. That's one thing. But here's where I think the conversation is missing something, and where we're missing an important um, and that is to say, I think we're still making the mistake of looking at the challenges of the future from an institutional point of view. What is it the institutions, the synagogues, the camps, the schools, and so forth, want to accomplish, as opposed to taking a, um, a, an individual, a person point of view as our starting point? Um, and I think here, the Torah, this week's Torah reading, provides us with an important and incredibly profound example of what I'm talking about. Um, Adam and Eve, um, you know, sex education, is that what we talked about earlier? <laughs> um, Adam and Eve eat from the apple of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's the consequence that they have from this act? The immediate consequence. There's two. One is they lose their immortality. They become human. Um, their lives will have an end. Admea ve esri. Would their grandchildren remember them as beautifully as we heard from Alan's grandchildren tonight? That's one consequence. The second is they're now accountable for their morality. Now that they understand the distinction between what is good and what is evil, 
They have the choice to choose the good or to follow the evil. And in having that choice, they become accountable for their actions. They have the capacity to build communities of meaning and purpose and goodness. They have the capacity to build communities of evil and destruction. And they have the capacity, quite frankly, for apathy, for nothing. So now they're accountable. And according to the Torah, God takes a walk through the Garden of Eden. And what do Adam and Eve do? They, they run and they hide. Absolutely. They run and they hide. And God calls out a question. One word. Ayeka. Where are you? It's not a question of geography. For if God is surely God, God knows where they are. They're hiding behind the bush on the left. <laughs> it's a question of, of relationship. The word ayeka comes from the Hebrew word eich. It's how are you in relationship to me, to God, to the goodness that you are now aware of and accountable to. And you might think that you can run, but as we read so beautifully and understand on Yom Kippur, through the story of Jonah, you can't hide. Not in the Garden of Eden, not in a ship to take you across the sea, not in the belly of a whale. Now that you have eaten from this fruit, you are accountable for your goodness. You are accountable for your morality. You are accountable for your actions. You are accountable for the relationship that you have with me as a human being. I'm sorry, with me, God, you as a human being. You're accountable to that relationship. And so if we don't build communities that ask the question of the people that we meet and relate to, if we don't ask Ayaka, where are you? Then how can we build the linkages to our tradition that helps them find the inspiration, the strength, and the guidance to live lives of purpose? Lives that matter. And when we talk about building sacred community, when we talk about studying Torah, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not about the ability to memorize and to recite chapter and verse. It's about being inspired by our tradition in our modern circumstance, in ways that make sense to our understanding of that circumstance, that answers that eternal question. Where am I? Who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning and the purpose of my life? And these questions are scary, by the way. Which is why not only do Adam and Eve run from them, but we do as well. But we have a beautiful thing as a, as a Jewish people. We have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur communally. We stand together in, by the thousands, um, exposing our vulnerabilities in order to address those questions. And the problem with our tefillah is not just the length. The problem with our tefillah is we forgot to ask those questions. And we assume that when people walk in the door and they open this door, the theology is going to make sense to them. And so if we don't address the issue of tefillah and the issue of Jewish learning in ways that address the issue of, uh, in ways that address the question ayaka, then everything that we're doing is just talk. Because building sacred community means that you build relationships around that question through Torah study and through prayer. What do I mean? I like to give the example of a don alum. Because everybody knows a don alum and nobody knows it. Because by the time you get to a don alum, you're standing up, taking off your tallis, you're folding it up, you're thinking, oh, it's time for kiddush. I wonder if it's a good one today. <laughs> Did the Bar Mitzvah family bring hot food? Um, 
and you're totally, you know, missing it. And if you've been to camp or USY and or junior congregation, you know, what is it that kids inevitably do at the Donalum? They sing it to the fastest melody they could possibly come up with. <laughs> When I was a kid, it was the William Tell Overture, not because it was William Tell, but because, you know, we liked the Lone Ranger. <laughs> and in so doing, we, we missed the whole point of this wonderful poem. Um, you know, by the way, why you can sing it to any melody under the sun? Um, and this I learned um, from one of my students, um, Ethan Goldberg, also a student of uh, Professor Sarnia. It's an iambic tetrameter. It's a 4-4 beat. Adon Ulam Asher Malat Paterico. It's also the beat of your heart. And it's the beat of the horse galloping. It's the rhythm of a human being without walking issues at their normal gait. It's the rhythm of the waters hitting the seashore. I can't for the life of me believe that the poem entitled Master of the Universe, Adon Olam, is written, to, it, it is written by accident to the rhythm of the universe. That can't be a coincidence. But it's the last verse that is so important that we always miss because we're heading out to Kiddush. <laughs> Adon I leave a lo ira. And that's the, that's the answer, by the way, to the question Ayeka from Bereshit. Adonai li, God is with me, velo ira, and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Right? Because I know I'm part of this incredible community, this rich tradition, this people that has not only survived for 4,000 years, but thrived, who've accomplished Everything we pray for for the last 2,000 years, except for perhaps the coming of Mashiach, may Mashiach come soon. But think about what we've done. We've reestablished ourselves in sovereignty in our ancestral homeland after 2,000 years of exile. We've achieved complete economic, social, political equality within the lands where 85% of the world Jews live today, North America and Israel. Anti-Semitism, though it still exists, it's not a corporate entity. The proof is the only people who cared that Chelsea Clinton married a Jew were the Jews. <laughs> this is what we've been praying for. So all of the assumptions that drove Jewish community for the last hundred years, for the last two thousand years, are gone. They're not coming back. And so I think what we have to do is we have to get back to basics. And, and the basics are, is to, the, the basics essentially are to decide that we're going to build communities that matter. That we're going to be unequivocal and unapologetic that the Judaism that we profess is a Judaism that matters. That it has the capacity to answer the question, Ayaka, where are you in relationship to God, to each other? to holiness. So that when we, every time we enter the synagogue, whether it's for tefillah, whether it's for learning, uh, whether it's for a social program, any time we gather anywhere, it doesn't have to be in a synagogue, in Jewish community, when we leave, we should leave with the feeling, I don't I leave below you are. God is with me and I'm not afraid. We have the capacity to do that. We whether or not we have the courage to do that, that's another question. I want to thank the Ticknor family for uh, doing this um, and sponsoring this symposium as you do every year. Um, I didn't know Alan, but everyone who I asked about him said the same thing. First of all, he was a mensch. Secondly, he was an innovator. Third of all, he was a connector. I also want to acknowledge Alan Addis one of the past presidents of United Synagogue. And I want to thank all of you for being here late into the evening and listening to the three of us about our ideas. And I look forward to answering these big questions and to, to building 
the vibrant future that we have waiting for us together. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are a timeless people. <laughs> that is why we are running 22 minutes late. Um, how, uh, we are also mindful of the fact, uh, what the Chancellor said, uh, the symposia are not supposed to last longer than two hours. <laughs> but we did promise some questions. Um, if we can do it, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one question for each of you, and not more than about 90 seconds. Do it. Uh, you'll see. Uh, there, and uh, uh, we'll try to do that. These questions were sent to me. They're not only mine. Um, I wanted to begin with the Chancellor. Um, what's fascinating today is that actually the reform movement is also facing significant challenges and also talking about how it needs change, but there is a great difference. It has defined its message in terms of youth engagement. The new head of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Jacobs, described his goal in a sentence, making sure this next generation is not just along for the ride, but is really taking responsibility for Jewish life. So my question is, how do we explain the difference between the broad vision of the conservative movement that we had the privilege here tonight and the very different, very narrow, square, a squarely addressed message of the reform movement? Is there similarly a big idea that motivates you the way that motivates him, or are they going on the wrong path and the conservative movement the right path? In 90 seconds. <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan used to be a friend of mine. So, <laughs> so um, I think that we should resist the idea that we can take complicated eternal issues and do them in 90 seconds. I don't think Judaism is an elevator speech. I think one of the things that characterizes this movement is the seriousness with which it wants to engage the whole Jewish person. When I think of slogans for our movement, I like something like tradition for today and tomorrow. The idea that every single Jewish human being has something vital to contribute to the conversation our people began with one another and the world and with God at Mount Sinai. Every single Jewish human being old and young, which is why we have to spend our lives and the great privilege of our lives learning how to answer this question that's put to us, which Steve and Julie expressed beautifully. What are we going to do with God's help to make this world of ours more just and compassionate? So I think that yes, Tikkun Olam is going to be part of this, but one, one of the things that's always, I might have 20 more seconds, learning and doing, which is what we both stressed here, learning the complex history of our people and its striving to live up to this responsibility, and then putting that age-old tradition in dialogue with what's going on right now. That is what conservative Judaism stands for. So let me, uh, uh, Rabbi Warnick, let me sharpen the question. This was sent to me. Um, the reform movement is focused now on youth engagement, while the United Synagogue has described co-op, its college arm, as peripheral to its mission, and it's trying to shut it down. Can you help us to understand 
why youth engagement would be so central to the reform movement and apparently so peripheral to the conservative movement. What is the future of the conservative movement on the college campus in 90 seconds? <laughs> So I'm going to uh, answer the question that I want to answer. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to do so this way. One is I think we do need to put a big idea out there, and I think that um, we can't compartmentalize and, and, and siloize where the answer is going to be for the future um, of us, uh, of, of the Jewish world. It's not youth engagement. I think it's much larger than that. It's holistic. Um, and uh, my vision and my goal for United Synagogue is for it to become a powerful partner with Kihilot um, in transforming the nature of congregational life in North America in the next decade. If we're going to really build these communities of learning and engagement and sacredness and so forth, we must have the most significant heavy investment in the people who are going to lead them at the same table professionals and laity, um, uh, coming up with homegrown solutions to the problems of their communities because they know them better than anybody else. What they need from us is inspiration, tools, resources, um, guides, network, and support. Um, in terms of the question of co-op in, in particular, the, um, the, the press did a, a really miserable job as, um, as, um, as is sometimes um, uh, experienced in really defining what the issue with Koch was. Uh, the issue with Koch for, for um, United Synagogue, which has, uh, which you know, gave birth to it, nurtured it, it's taken care of it for the last 25 plus years, is that we just reached the point that we, we can't kid ourselves anymore that a $250,000 a year allocation is making a significant difference on the college campus of North America. Um, and if we're gonna get involved um, which we have to be involved in order to assure the continuity of our people with the college campus, then we need to convene a broader table of stakeholders, and we need to create a bigger, bolder, better vision of what that's going to be, and we need to get out there, and we need to do it seriously, we need to do it well, um, and, and it has to be meaningful. Um, and, and so the, the issue was not, you know, um, leaving the college campus. The issue was a challenge to um, uh, you know, driven from a, from a variety of reasons as to how we reimagine it. Um, United Synagogue um, is doing just that. We convened a table of key stakeholders and thinkers from not only from within our movement front, but um, from um, outside people with expertise in Hill on the college campus world, um, and we're in the midst of creating that bigger, better, bolder vision at this moment. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Schoenfeld, uh, the Jewish Week today, and indeed one of our questioners, point, and in, actually in reviewing the very book you mentioned, The Observant Jewish Life, which I recommend to all of you, argued that there is a great disconnect between conservative rabbis and the people they serve, and it uses the book as an example of that. I wonder if you think there is such a disconnect, and if so, what can the RA do to bridge that divide? Sure, I, I did read the, uh, the review. I actually read it somewhat differently. I, I don't think that they were uh, talking about the disconnect between rabbis and congregations. The book really spoke about the struggle of the colleagues who wrote the chapters to get at what I was describing in my talk, right? To describe the totality of Judaism even including practices that conservative rabbis are not advocating for our communities, but to use that learning and understanding to give people a deeper uh, meaning. It's not really unlike the fundamental study of the Gemara, where you study things that are clearly no longer relevant necessarily in the present day. They were using some, ex uh, some very specific examples of practices, or not practiced in the current day, but still are very illuminating as to the essence of Judaism. To answer your question more directly, I, I always find this uh, question rather interesting. I believe that conservative rabbis are the only religious leaders of any stripe in the world about whom it is said that there is something inappropriate 
about the fact that they dwell among people who may not presently be as pious as they are. Indeed, is that not the mission of the holy man or woman, right? To have some kind of a sense of experience and connection deeply to religious life and to want to bring it to other people. That is part of religious leadership. Uh, I certainly understand the value of communities that we have, both rabbi-led and not rabbi-led, where people are um, striving for equal practice. I also believe in many ways that the rabbi can be viewed as someone who is first among equals on matters of morality, general education, etc. But the rabbi ought to be someone who is striving ahead into more untried terrain of religious experience and trying to bring that back to the people he or she lives with. All right. Well, I'm sure there are many more questions, but it's always good to leave with questions. I point out we've gone on exactly two hours, and now to conclude with our version of I don't know long. <laughs> Lafer, and I have the honor of co-chairing the program this evening in memory of my friend, mentor, advisor, confidant, and follow my Alan Tickner blessed memory. Thank you to Professor Jonathan Sarna for doing an outstanding job as moderator for this evening's discussion. Thank you to Chancellor Eisen, Rabbi Schoenfeld, and Rabbi Warnick for taking time out of your busy schedules and participating in this evening's program. Our family and community are very grateful. We would like to present each of you with a piece of artwork by Gal Amalia. Hannah and Tammy are just going to present that to you. I want to thank Rabbi Gordon, who and he and I work very closely together in planning this event. Tony Daniels, our outstanding executive director. Cassie, ba Cassie Baptista, our marketing and communication specialist here at CMT. And the staff at JTS, the United Synagogue, and the RA for the help. All the organizations are extremely uh, pleasant to work with and very gracious and we really appreciate it. It made the evening very smooth. And finally, thank you to the committee at CMT for the time and assistance. Please join us for dessert in the Copeland Clark Social Hall, which is if you exit to the back. Good evening.